Welcome guys, gals and non-binary pals to this week's episode of Buffy Boys, your weekly review of Buffy the Vampire Slayer from a queer, literary and feminist perspective. My name is Joel, I'm one of your hosts and with me as always is your other harmonious host. Brian, hi. Hi, how are you Brian? Grand. I feel at peace. Do you feel at peace? No. No? Do you Why feel, do you feel at peace? Uh, I, f- I feel that compared to the last time we were re- recording, yeah, well, where that's... there was like bing bang bong and there was like, you know, drilling and birds attacking the windows and like... Uh, re- plague of frogs and all this other crazy stuff happening well, that's for sure true i definitely feel less like under pressure than i did last week last week I was, like just bank call day mondays lovely and have such intense repercussions like <laughs> on uh tuesday last week i had to do all my monday work which i already ba- like i tend to do tons of work on monday and um, like basically wall like um i was gonna say boss to the wall but that's not really what i mean wall to wall uh with work and t- try to like leave space for their to be problems cropping up through the rest Mm -hmm. of the week um so doing that on on tuesday instead and like i do all the washing on 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 mondays and then i always had to record the podcast on tuesday Mm -hmm. it was it was a lot um i i feel quite strange obviously this is a strange period in mm -hmm. general because we're kind of a year on and all that kind of stuff but um yeah i very much feel like i'm doing a lot of things right now which if done in person will intrinsically be like huge undertakings yep. like so much of what i would usually do for work involved venues and catering and mm-hmm. printed papers and uh, handshakes and all that kind of stuff and there's a real like weird vibe about doing it online where it's like well i guess i'm finished and i turn to the left and watch youtube for a bit yeah yeah it's the it's the it's the real problem it's, it's a real problem for you specifically because um when pa- first p- pandemic first started obviously we, we live in a two-bed apartment um i have the uh, one of the bedrooms i use as an office you couldn't u- also use as an office because you listen to bad music all day i try you wouldn't let me i try yeah. to sit beside you but um <laughs> you if i did that <laughs> i would fucking kill you uh so you're si- you're using the sitting room yeah. um slash dining room slash not dining rooms the sitting room slash kitchen for your for your um office and one of the great one of the important things about working from home is having a distinction between your workspace your and your work mentality mm-hmm. and your at home mentality um, whether it be cl- changing your clothes, which I know you're not a fan of, or, um, you know, just stepping away into another space, you yeah. know, and just leaving it behind. Um, and it's really difficult to do when you're kind of doing both of them at the same place. Um, like, yeah. you know, if you're like stepping away, being like, oh, well, I could just continue to work while I play some Destiny after work. Yeah, that's not good. Yeah, and I, I create a real sense of, like, I draw a lot of professionalism from I'm on my work clothes, I'm in a certain context and all that. Whereas, like, I have done given presentations, I've taken exams um, in my bare feet mm-hmm. from this, from the standing desk here in the sitting room. So, it's, yeah. It's, so yeah, I feel this weird, compared to la- last week, I feel this weird, like, um, fung house mirror kind mm-hmm. of vibe to things. So, let's see what kind of energy that brings to this particular episode. Um, so, this week on Buffy Boys, we are looking at season six, episode nine of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Smashed. Yeah, indeed. Or Smash It. Smash It. Um... All three of the next episodes kind of uh, references to being drunk. So this one's smashed. Next episode is... Wrecked. Wrecked. And the third one is uh, gone, I think. Which I think is a stretch, but... Yeah, like too far gone, I suppose, but... Yeah, and uh, it was first aired on November the 20th, 2001. Um, it was directed by Turi Mayer, who... Or Meyer, I'm not sure. Um, this is the only episode he directed. Uh, he produced a lot of Smallville um, and Vampire Diaries. He uh, directed three Angel episodes overall um, as well. And he wrote Leprechaun 2. So that's fun. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was written by Dave, uh, by Drew Z. Greenberg. He's openly gay, which is fun. Um, and explains the uh, the dancing boys in the cages. Yeah, yeah, we'll come um, to the cage boys. He uh, wrote six episodes of Buffy overall. He will write six episodes of Buffy overall. Um, he wrote for Firefly, Smallville, The OC, Clone Wars, Dexter's, Agent, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. So I think he's quite heavily involved with um, Mutant Enemy productions. Mutant mm. Enemy? Yeah, that's what I mean, yeah. Um, anyway, here's your Buffy on summary. The trio steal a diamond. Willow derats Amy. The two work mischief <laughs> at the bronze. Spike discovers he can hit Buffy painlessly. Warren checks the chip, which is still working. Spike draws the conclusion that Buffy is no longer quite human and attacks her. Their fight turns into a violent sex that demolishes a derelict taste, which ignores the um, the diamond stuff and uh, the frozen guy, which is actually quite plot relevant. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, anyway, 
Yeah. How are you, Joe? Sorry, we already went through all that. We did. Yeah. Before we talk about the Buffy stuff, um, Lex um, work her own mischief over in the bronze, her own banterific mischief, um, which is now tempting. Now, now that I say banterific, it's reminding me of that impersonation of a South Siger that you did earlier on, because uh, it reminds me of being in school. I'm very tempted to make you do it on mic, but we'll see if it... Uh, I, 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 it can only really come naturally. I can't, yeah. I can't do it. We'll see if it's a natural and organic. It would um, sound like inexplicable to, to anyone outside of Ireland, and anyone outside of Dublin, potentially. Uh, um, I, I, I have been enjoying some clips recently, or I say clips, sorry, TikToks, um, of the Graham Norton show and of American guests trying to interpret Irish sports players who were like it was, it was someone from like it wasn't from cork but i think it was from oh the two the two rowers rowers sorry yeah and just yeah. that they're in they're in they're in parse unparsable um, yeah. irish accents well like one of our real fucking pet hates is for uk drag race which is great honestly um go watch it uh graham norton is one of the judges mm. and rupaul can't say his fucking name he calls him graham he calls him graham he also calls him a national treasure but like or not of that nation <laughs> yeah like like graham norton's a national treasure of ireland yeah he's irish it's from fucking cork and he makes wine that we've drank yeah it's not very good no it's not but over in the bronze we are hanging out chilling out and talking about a tv show um surprise surprise klaxon that brian put me on to um which is the dc animated originals uh, universe uh harley quinn yeah which i think it airs on dc universe as a as a program or an online venue and hbo max i believe um mm. so we just fucking torrented it because we're fucking rebels mm. um dc come at us please anyway it's really really good um it was fascinating i i have to say i was in, instantly hooked hard recommendation i took the unusual step of actually recommending it to people who i think might be listening to this episode off mic immediately you know mm-hmm. by text um it, i think it's actually quite relevant to a lot of what we're talking about here yeah. um so what i find if so if we don't if it, you're not familiar with it you know because there's so many different marvel dc cartoons shows all that kind of stuff it's essentially harley quinn who was previously most famous for being the joker's girlfriend and who is also in suicide Squad, played by margot robbie of recent memory a fascinating origin to the character obviously being that she's one of the two kind of major characters mm-hmm. in comic books who transitioned from animated series or a cartoon series to comics so yeah. harley quinn originated in the um the batman the animated series yeah. which is the classic uh cartoon yeah. and probably the best cartoon ever made realistically <laughs> yeah. except for simpsons um she originated there and then transitioned into comic books and now in cinema is in film and stuff yeah. and the other one being um x23 who originated in x-men evolution the cartoon mm-hmm. yeah and then became quite big in the comic books in the young young mutants no what was it called anyway um new mutants yeah. comic books and n- then also transitioned into being in movies she was in logan and stuff yeah so the, the casual viewer might recognize her as the teenage young wolverine girl mm-hmm. essentially in logan, in logan yeah. Um, but yeah so harley quinn originally in the bruce tim um batman animated show um that was the oh really bruce, yeah, yes oh sorry bruce tim is the creator bruce tim is the overall creator yeah of... i thought i thought that we had this mistake this problem the last sorry, time we were talking yes. about him because bruce tim is <laughs> is bruce well i think bruce um uh Bruce Tim is Bruce Tim is a showrunner and creator of the Batman animated series. What you point out is that his name is also a combination of Bruce as in Bruce Wayne and Tim as in Tim Drake, who's yeah. one of the Robins, which is appears to be confusing. And, it is confusing for me, yes. Yeah, which I've never I've never thought of because I've always I've always seen it written down. Um, anyway, Harley Quinn originates in that show as a foil and as you know a lesser Joker character essentially. Um, people loved her. She transitioned into other things. This new series. Um, is uh or not new but new to us recent series 2019 2019 2020 yeah. there should be a new season coming out soon is um starts off with that premise of her being classic har- har- uh, harlequin dressed accomplice to the joker he he lets her die essentially she decides to strike out on her own transitions to essentially margot robbie's costume and it's like I'm sick of being a sidekick and I'm sick of being you know the the girl sidekick I'm going to create my own crew but from the off it is incredibly incredibly adult and incredibly mm-hmm. mature uh mature language mature, mature themes like and not what like it i think 
like the very first thing is like on when they attack a boat and it's like uh you know a lot of white men being like we, we're here doing what we love best being white being racist and getting money by fucking over minorities or something like that you mm-hmm. know and very violent very um irreverent ex- the dc uh canon yeah so there's a the bane is one of the characters and it draws from all its different continuities uh the bane portrayal basically takes the piss out of tom hardy hardy's uh vocal performance in in in, in the dark knight rises that distinctive what you're talking about Joe? No, that's the worst one that kind of the worst accent they expect one of us in the record brother that's pretty good that's that wasn't pretty good. too bad yeah. um and all that kind of stuff so i say all this stuff and immediately i think if you were to describe this to me south park humor yeah. which people say south park has critical value i've never taken that particularly juvenile pure raw side of things i think if you took put together one season of the good south park yeah. episodes and you might have an, a tv show of critical value um i i don't rate it at all yeah. but what i found exceptional about Har- harley quinn so far is while all of that is there the foul mouth the violence all that kind of stuff it um it doesn't cringe at all i think for the vast vast majority of it um it is Genuinely funny. Genuinely funny. Like moment to moment laughter. Um it And so much of that like so much of that like lives or dies based on if this is a funny or not. It takes a very arrested development approach to humor where mm. it's just like throwing out eight hundred jokes in the writer's room at the same time and be like, let's put them all in and then move on and whatever sticks sticks, which is I think a great humor source. Yeah, you, you want and this is the problem you know, we often say with stand-up comedy is that uh, when it's not good, which it often isn't, unfortunately, is that you want a, the person or thing making jokes to be confident in mm-hmm. that it's funny or they don't really care, you know? Yeah. Um, and it does that very well. Um, it is a, a stories that are kind of drawing on themes of like original. Um, the, its relationship with both the DC canon is quite like irreverent, but also um, its awareness of like actual existing pop culture, real life, you know, it doesn't feel like it exists in this sanitized bubble. It feels like it actually exists adjacent to our our, our, our real life, but in a way that like it, it it doesn't feel like it will age badly. Like the jokes aren't to films that came out last year or anything like yeah, that. Sure. Um, and yeah, it's uh, it's. It's it, it's fascinating to me for a couple of reasons. One, how they get made because it feels like it absolutely should be made but very disrespectful to the at times like family friendly brand that a lot of either family friendly or edgy joker kind of brand Mm -hmm. um dc has often had a problem in taking itself particularly compared to marvel far too seriously and this does not do that Uh, and also i find comic books as i mentioned before absolutely fascinating for the the fact that they are modern mythology they're modern archetypes they sit around the, the the fireplace and look at shadows on the cave wall endlessly refreshing and this really does refresh uh, in, 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 in kind of very significant way but perhaps the thing that is most compelling about it uh, is that it is uh, queer very queer mm-hmm. um, Harley Quinn Harley Quinn's main and uh, very feminist as well you know adjacently yep. um, to that point Harley Quinn's partner and kind of the, ma- the, the deuteragonist is Poison Ivy uh, in the comics for a number of years has been kind of a developing relationship, relationship romantic relationship between them best friendship and then subsequent sexual romantic relationship and the show very much is like about that it's about them actually having an explicitly developing relationship my understanding is that further in the show it becomes like completely explicit as in like they are girlfriends doing crime and that for season three i was reading the hiring more queer writers because they're like this is the direction the show has got is foregrounding this yeah. massively so there's something like we talk about having walked through the legend of cora and at the end of it being like oh this was always a queer show and how rare that felt mm-hmm. and to go in it's the one thing i'm very open to spoiling is i could go into something and know it's queer it makes it such a such an invigorating watch i yeah. think you have to watch a show from a different universe which is a timeline where like shows are just queer do you know what i yeah. mean like I, I find that very engaging I saw a lot of um, comparisons between it and She-Ra in terms of how it felt like, oh, this could be uh, queer baiting, and in, hmm. instead it turned out to just be queer. Um, where it feels like, oh, these interactions, these tender moments, these moments of genuine affection can be written off, and choosing to use that as, it's so funny because using that as the basis on which to build a relationship, it's it's good writing, and it's just shitty that like uh, stuff like that feels <clears throat> like it can go one of two ways, where it's either 
genuine and present or um like a bit of a fuck you to the community uh queer baiting if you're not familiar with it i would say just to go into youtube put in queer baiting and there are about 800 video essays that are all quite good every single one of them will re- reference supernatural um sherlock uh sherlock absolutely sherlock and if if you, if there's someone suggesting that sherlock, uh, that supernatural is not queer baiting because of the last season um in which like, they actually do end up in a, like one of them professes his love for the other guy. Um, it's nonsense. It's supernatural is a trash show. Anyway, um, yes, I really like Harley Quinn. It's just very funny. It's very good. It's beautifully animated as well. Yeah, and it has an exceptional voice cast. Like the first episode was three times as long as its runtime because we had to keep pausing and being like, "This is this person. This is that person." Yeah. Um, I would relate most to the humor uh and context of as you say rest of the album great shit also bob's burgers to a certain degree but I, I just think that joke like the joke you love from bob's burgers where there's a mystery novel called death cabernet for cutie sure um is is very much there as well so hard recommend for me i have to say i'm i'm i'm, I'm in a little bit of a crush with it at the moment and um, but speaking of um uh Speaking of lesbian themes and addiction issues, in this episode of Buffy. Yeah, so this episode is smashed. Uh, It is, Joel, the episode where when you were watching when you were younger, your parents (laughs) got a broom and started banging the ceiling to be like, stop watching this because they were also watching it downstairs. Yeah. Which, looking back, why weren't you watching it together? I, well, I... uh, I don't know why they they were watching it. I watched two programs with my family, which which my with my dad really, which was Stargate SG One and Star Trek and its various incarnations. Probably Enterprise at that point. It was yeah, we did watch Enterprise together. Um, and uh, how did you watch the finale? That was the no. That was actually the finale of Star Trek Voyager, which I did I I, I did watch wearing a wearing a Star Trek uniform. And what kind of uniform, Joel? Um, it was a Command Division TNG era 2363 to 2369 uniform. Command. Command, yeah. That's very uh, ambitious of you. So it, it, a little a little insight into the nagging in this relationship. Brian got me a Star Trek mug at one point and specifically got one which was inscribed for a commander, which is the second in command, because you said like I wasn't good enough to have the captain's mug. I can't remember. Can't fully remember that. But I believe it. <laughs> is that the one with the T R Grey hot? Yeah, no. Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah. It says. Uh, it says something like "Here's your T commander on it," or something. And that was a deliberate thing that you did. Okay. Yeah. No, I did get that. Uh, yeah. yeah. Specifically written on. But I was watching up upstairs in the bedroom, and it sounds very. It sounds very like bougie to like have a TV in my bedroom, but like I was an only child in an incredibly deprived area. I wasn't going outside, so I had like one of those big boxy ones with like mm-hmm. a huge junk in the trunk. Do you, do you consider yourself to be an only child still? Because your sister was born when you were 16, so... Oh, no, I, think, no, I definitely don't consider myself an only no, child now. But you had such an only child upbringing. It's such an unusual thing to have, a, like, one sibling who's yeah. 16 years younger than you. So at the the point I'm referencing where Smash came out, it would have been, oh, of course, it would have been, been 10 been. or 11 at the time. Yeah. Um, but I think I have... I think the... the yes, the, the attitude and behaviours of an only child... Um, solidified before my sister was born because mm-hmm. as you said i was 16 when she was born so i definitely have an only child's mentality absolutely yeah um which i think is is abundantly clear in a lot of my behavior um but yeah so uh, anyway back to the episode so so one of the reasons why they uh, there's banging on the ceiling is because there was banging in the episode as well and it, it marks for me in, in an era where the show does transition into very very special episode kind of themes and i think a lot of what we need to talk about with this and going forward is a the sexual content between buffy and spike and b the addiction issues uh, expressed through willow and its handling of that where it is sufficient and where it is perhaps um broadly broadly drawn well speaking first to the addiction stuff so i've, I've seen a couple of places online and um Mark Field talks about it and uh, a couple of different texts discuss just like w- magic in this situation and kind of just the issues around why is it that Willow is treated like this for using magic? You know, is Tara justified mm. in her reaction to her for just like actively using magic? Because in this episode, they, they praise Willow a lot for doing some hacking. Yeah. And they say, oh, it's so nice to see you do that. It's been ages since you've done that. And it has been, I think the last time was Primeval. Mm. Um, so is there an element here that it's just like, uh, that she's 
othering herself through using magic. And I think that's really missing out on the, the point of the writing here, which is that magic is being communicated as addiction substance. Um, you know, that's a, a, a one of many, many substance, not substance even as physical, but addictive property. Um, and in so many instances, addictive properties, when used appropriately, no problem whatsoever. You know, uh, I think there's there are very few people who would suggest that alcohol shouldn't be part of our society to some degree, but it's when you abuse alcohol, rely on it, and use it to solve your problems mm -hmm. that it becomes an issue. And that is what everyone's identifying with Willow is that she is over relying on this substance. Um, and I, I think reading more into it, being like, you know, oh, but you know, why magic? You know, because it, like I, as a metaphor, it's imperfect for these reasons. It's like no, as a metaphor, it's grand. It's just addiction. Yeah, I, I think kind of what happens with and this control, really addiction, control, and you know, magic as a as a medium for agency and will and control and most importantly to look at the deep character flaws that willow has as a person and the insecurity she exhibits and the extent to which she will go and does go because of it which is like it's, it's all explored very carefully and very well yeah. not carefully but it's all explored quite thoroughly thoroughly absolutely yeah i, I think what people overlook sometimes in their reflection on this kind of thing is that um a metaphor can have more than one use yep. a metaphor it, like magic is used as a metaphor for um sex in season five for sex it's used as a metaphor for femininity and also for relationships uh, femininity feminism relationships between women um as circuitous to you know hierarchy uh, at times and i think if you were to mix the connotations of that with the addictive connotations like you would get a very mixed metaphor you know mm -hmm. you would get a very confused point and also what 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 magic is, is kind of unusual for in this context is any of the things you commonly consider um addictive in terms of um you know uh, you know um like drug use or or alcohol or any of that kind of stuff and um, don't actually have utility to them mm -hmm. in society one of the interesting things about, about willow is like would willow be drawn in by say um, you know, substance use or alcoholism, probably not. Um, where you can get Willow as a character is because she wants to be useful. Mm -hmm. And it, it, what is addictive about it is this capacity for use. And, you know, what Amy plays on in this episode is like, oh, are you still that dumb, like, like lonely girl? Not dumb, but like silly lonely girl that had no uh, impact or influence that you were in high school. And what she's been, what is, as a kind of a, a competent person like Willow can be undercut by saying, oh, magic is not a dangerous thing. I'm using it to very strong effect. You know? There's definitely some comparisons we've made there about just like the, I, I think there's a very queer storyline in that too, in mm -hmm. the sense that there's, there's such an, an odd, uh, there's such an odd power thing that goes on for queer people in their twenties where they feel empowered to some degree and become kind of bitter and kind of difficult as people in, in lots of ways because they were so controlled growing up and so afraid and careful that when they feel like they, they can own their stuff some queer people uh have a tendency to go through a bit of a a bit of a bitter period and a bit of a up themselves not up themselves that's, that sounds awful but um I just think just yeah, like i mean a, a bit of a bit of power hungriness you definitely see that in specifically in queer organizations mm -hmm. amongst like you know uh young adults and i mean young adults not young adults like 16 year olds i mean mm -hmm. 18 to kind of 25 year olds where given a bit of power within a group you'll often find them like you know excommunicating each other creating this kind of extreme drama and stuff i think that's a very similar situation to here where you threaten to expose willow as this yeah, child and mm. uh, non-person, I think she feels, probably, if you take away this singular thing which identifies her, which is her magic. Yeah, no, I think it's a very salient point. I, I think what supports it is what, dif what differentiates her from her friends is that Willow has access to this X thing, which is magic, and it is affecting her and it's not affecting her friends. Mm -hmm. And what that reflects is, as you're saying there, I think that, you know, if we were to take it as a theme of metaphor, that delayed adolescence, that, you know, if we were to take something as, as mundane as alcohol, people, teenagers experiment with that in their, you know, in their teenage years. It's in a, it's kind of, everyone's doing it at the same time. There's a social construct around it. Um, 
friend groups create and are kind of collapse under similar divisions that you're suggesting etc and that all happens say on average between 14 and 19 that kind of period um, and then for queer people their experience is something which they didn't have an opportunity to do in their teenage years and it takes on a different connotation because they're in their 20s and people are like why are you acting like a teenager it's because i didn't get to be a teenager that's the bluntest way to put it um and with willow it's similar where she is you know if we take as a metaphor for queerness or for the queer experience in this context she is going through something that her friends have already gone through to a certain degree. You mm-hmm. know, she's doing like, it by look, herself. Yeah, look at Buffy. I mean, like Buffy had this extreme power when she was quite young. And because of that, because of the responsibility she's felt doing that, she had to really learn a sense of control and a sense of a duty quite young. And Willow having obtained that after having felt so um, powerless and being given that it's it's it, like of course it's open to abuse um yeah. so I, basically what we're saying is don't give queer people any responsibilities because they power run, walks away yeah they'll run, run away with it and probably kill their girlfriend yeah magneto was right um i think as well what's important to look looking at this is from a critical point of view is that while we can find these themes here as a useful tool it's not necessarily we're saying that's as it was written. You no, know, yeah, I don't of course. They, and I, I, but I think as we get deeper into the nuance of this, um, it's important to bear in mind that like it can like these themes can still be present and have legitimacy, yeah. even if they you know the myth of the kind of the authorial intent to a certain degree. I think mm-hmm. is very relevant here because how we are going to look at and how one would look at a queer woman going through addiction issues uh, and the. Um, the sexual content between Buffy and Spike now is going to be very different than how we would, we would have interpreted it at the time. And I think that's kind yeah. of salient as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, there is an, a notable instance here where, so basically the context here is that Willow has uh, changed Amy back from being a rat um, in the only use of her magic in episodes and episodes with any use really. Yeah. Um, apparently Joss Whedon was written to by a lot of fans telling him that the average lifespan of a rat is about three years. So to make sure to bring Amy back soon <laughs> um so uh she gets brought back and um well I was trying to reacclimate her to things they go out partying because you know Amy's still a teenager realistically yeah and she, she thinks she's had to go to prom yes yeah. exactly and um at one point Amy um like offers Willow to get something of her taste i.e to she dings her finger at a woman very Sabrina like and gets her to come over to like flirt with Willow yeah. under Amy's control, essentially. And Willow really balks at this. She really, she really dislikes it. And it's a very interesting point of tension, I thought, between that and kind of what she was comfortable in doing mm. with uh, with Tara and with with the rest of the Scoobies in Tabula Rasa and in um, God, I can't remember what the episode it was called. Uh, previous to um, uh, Once More with Feeling, where she she wipes um, uh, Tara's memory, but. It, it, with, with with that during this episode willow at a couple of points really diminishes the issues with tara when she's talking to to um anya sander and buffy about having uh fought with tara she says oh it kind of just small things got blown out of proportion yeah and it's like well no you've you've shown in this episode that you should understand the responsibility that you have here to not take advantage of people who are not fully in control um, in the context of this woman who she doesn't want to uh, like flirt with um, while she's under the influence of Amy's spell. Mm-hmm. Um, but she can't understand that distinction in her own actions. Um, so there's, there, there's a tension there. I think that's quite compelling, quite interesting. Because yeah, so Willow says at various points, like I think she says like, yeah, Tyro just like took my magic use, which is totally normal, out of context and overreacted essentially. Um, so she doesn't understand herself why this is happening yeah. to her um which is very like it's, it's, it's deeply tragic no absolutely and it's so obvious to the external observer and what i think what tara does which really helps elucidate this point is that she's very explicit she she says early on this is my concern this is why this is what i need you to do and then willow doesn't fall through with that and then she's like and therefore <laughs> yeah i am no i'm as i said i am no longer going to like you know be with you um and with the one thing i will say about well, one thing I will say about that scene in the bronze, uh, aside from its various like Sabrina Spellman like qualities, which are like I kind of love the scene. To uh, yeah, on. it's a little cheesy, but it's enjoyable. Is both with how um, 
Amy deals with compelling that woman to flirt with um, Willow and how they deal with the two men who are being like quite sexually aggressive with them. Yeah, um, and who calls uh, Willow Allen. Yeah, which is like such like a shit insult in, in so many ways. It's yeah. a much better insult now. True, no, true. No, that Ellen, uh, damning. Yeah. That everyone hates Ellen. Yeah. Um, DeGeneres, just to be specific, not any other Ellens you may know. Um, but in both cases, it could easily have gone that they would make them gay. Because mm-hmm. when you think about it, like, like, they specifically make a point that that woman who is, is brainwashed to come up with the willow is already flirting with a woman. And I think I read that the initial plotting for those two men was to turn them into women or make, was it turn them into women or make them kiss each other? Make them kiss each other as men. Okay, I thought it was either going to be turning them into women so they would be with Willow or make them kiss each other's No, men. no. But anyway, but all- Basically, Greenberg, who wrote it, uh, gay man, and apparently likes to write gay characters explicitly into all the pilots he writes, which is great for him, but he wanted to have those two guys kissing in that situation instead sent them to be gay go go dancers in, in cages. Um, and Joss Whedon vetoed that decision to have them kiss each other and because he was saying, well, I don't want to show that a being gay is a kind of like something that's influenceable yeah in influence in or yeah not can be influenced or as a punishment exactly or a punishment specifically yeah which is you know it's 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 maybe a topic for a different podcast but it's a fascinating trap that people fall into because even we had a high profile example chris evans a couple years ago saying whatever it was um you know oh trump if you love mitt mitt Whatever his name was, Mitt Romney. No, but the, the Mitch, Mitch McConnell? McConnell, the turtle looking motherfucker, whatever. Yeah, yeah. And if you love him so much, why don't you go marry him or kiss him? It was something like that. Where it's, it's like this line that's that, like strike people pull it all the time, which is like, oh, you know, I think he does protect us too much about like about gay, about straight men who are being homophobic, being like, oh, you're probably secretly gay if you're being homophobic. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, well, no, you know, most it, homophobic people are almost entirely straight, yeah. and um you latch onto examples of this because you want to differentiate between yourselves and those bad people who actually know you're, you're, you're inflicting harm on yourselves. Yeah. It's this um, weird thought that like for people to be that, that virulently homo- homophobic, they must have some internalized self-hatred. And it's like, no, there's more majority- examples of that for sure. But-, but the majority of hatred is externalized. <laughs> yeah. it's, like the, like the, the, the assumption there is that the most potent um, driver of hate is um, self-loathing when it's actually um, like, like hatred of other people do yeah you know? i wouldn't be like, oh, what i'd say there is that there's definitely a strong psychological impulse there which is when you look at like straight men you know are they naturally that um idiotic and like bullheadedly masculine no of course not if they were left they're like grown up they grew up in a field surrounded by deer and um, like hanging out with the nature they would like they would grow up to be like probably like have incorporated much more feminine gestures at times, you know, where they don't really aggressively doctor their own behavior to adapt to a specifically masculine perspective. Some of them would grow up to have like, you know, exclusively masculine kind of um, behaviors because in that kind of wild context, masculine and feminine behaviors aren't necessarily, are, are probably have some degree of being influenced by hormonal um, bodily stuff, but very, very little of it is. Um, and so much of it is social that like or conversely things which are naturally influenced by you know physical um, traits become retroactively considered to be feminine or masculine well, by, how, you know, by how people are read anyway yeah know? so I mean if you have those the, the, I think those men who identify some aspect of feminine actions within themselves or even worse, like what they would identify as homosexual actions, which or, or queer actions of like, you know, hand gestures and stuff like that, which are not necessarily feminine, but are specifically mm. queer coded. Not queer coded, but like um, queer identified yeah. in the, by, by the straights. Uh, Pink seeing flags, that, as opposed to red flags. <laughs> what you say? Pink flags, as Pink opposed flags. to red flags. Yeah. As seeing those actions within themselves and seeing the tendency towards that and knowing that they have to keep that shut down cr- does create a significant amount of self-hatred and seeing someone else engaging in that with no recourse and no remorse is very very damaging to them i think and yeah. so i think it's i think it's a very much um a lot of just external hatred of the other yeah. there's a strong sense of that i think there's an also a basis of that of say help like hatred of the self as well no i think it's, it's absolutely prolific and prevalent it's it's just not the simplest explanation for homophobia that some well-meaning people often think it is yeah um but 
having those two men dance as go-go gangsters in the cage was quite funny. I also did recall uh, to me days of, of uh, gay bars now long closed in, in Dublin at a simpler time. Yeah, yeah. specifically the dragon. They the always, dragon. Remember, remember that clip going around of the, in the dragon of um, a drag queen falling off the, the rafters there? Yes. That was great. Such a long bar. It was a, an incredibly Narrow. long venue, yeah. yeah. Um, so we engaged through Willow with kind of you know, Amy, she has an outlet through Amy to have kind of more carefree away from the pressures and the criticisms that she's getting from her her kind of more mature um, friends and family. Um, and on the flip side of that, we have Buffy interacting with kind of a similar nexus of kind of, you know, where to go in terms of maturity, in terms of emotional complexity in her interactions with Spike. Yeah, so the it's quite sad. So um, the at one point, Buffy goes to talk to Willow in this episode to hopefully hopefully like just like have a friend to talk to and she almost gets there to like talking to her and it kind of feels unusual because it's the first time she feels like she's actually interacted with willow since she's been back to life and i I, like i mean probably at some point in season early season five was the last time they had an actual conversation Mm -hmm. maybe it was like the body kind of thing um the body of yogi yeah and uh Instead, Willow is like, oh, yeah, Amy's here. It's so nice to have another magical person around. Magically <laughs> magical inclined girl. friend. Yeah. <laughs> magical girl. Uh, and Buffy kind of takes that as a, oh, you don't have time for me right now. And that's fine. Which is really sad. But yeah, no, Buffy is, is very still very lost here. She's no idea of her identity in terms of why she's uh, lashing out at herself and doing this kind of self-harm um, that is kind of this romance with Spike. Mm-hmm. Um, and... That leads to blows between them. Um, and first of all, Buffy just like fully decks Spike and out of habit in this situation. But like, if you're in any way romantically inclined towards someone, hitting them in any context or not hitting people in any context, but like as a show, mixing her being like, oh, I'm kissing you now, but now I'm hitting you is like, that's not great. Yeah. And yeah. in he, he does hit her back and um, doesn't get hurt, which is where this happens from. But he, she hits him again later on in the episode. So... Oh, God. I have so many problems with the Spike-Buffy relationship. This Buffy. Um, and I know people fucking love this relationship. And I really, really feel like that desire for them to be together and that shipping is such a factor in this writing in this show. Mm-hmm. Because... I think objectively at, we have to say it's present. The fan interest is present in this writing. Yeah, yeah. like the, the extent to which Buffy's... Um, the extent to which Spike's storyline has been adapted to account for the love that fans have for for this interaction is so insane. Like you have such mixed messages. Like I remember which episode it was where um the one where Drusilla comes back for the last time and Spike kidnaps both of them and tortures them. Basically, it's for love is that? No, it's not okay. like full for love. Um, I don't think so. Anyway, um, stuff like, stuff like that, and and then coming into this area and then going forward into the soul canon stuff is just all so so damaged and mixed and confused like in this episode you have spike um once he thinks that buffy uh or or his chip is broken immediately goes to try to attack someone yeah (laughs) which is like okay well last episode he was like talking about how he was on the path true redemption um when he was uh to build a rasset and didn't like you know show exhibit any any um, intrinsic kind of predatory behavior yeah. exactly yeah when turned into a blank slate and in this episode he's like oh first thing i'm gonna do if i think that my sp- my chip is is broken is try to attack someone mm-hmm. and also i'm going to torture buffy a little bit emotionally by telling her that she's come back broken yeah i, I, I remember that very specifically in my original watch it's so like harsh it is it's so specifically playing on Buffy's uh, vulnerability and concerns here. Like, <laughs> he's gone from being the, the only person who she confided in that she was in heaven. And he's like, well... How can I capitalize on this? How can I capitalize yeah. on this, yeah. And then, obviously, that leads to a point. I'm like, it's 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 such a messy trajectory. Because if he if this is what he was building towards, an actual emotional low point, which he does experience when he attempts to rape Buffy. Um, and that's why he, through his own self-disgust, he goes off and he gets a soul um or he 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 wins a soul for himself um in this context it's like 
it, it's just such a jagged line of tr- in terms of where he's moving. It's like, oh, he's moving towards goodness, and you know, every night he 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 saved her, etc. And now it's like, oh, but also, uh, I'm gonna kill this person over here. Cheers. It's I, like at various points. Like I, I think they needed to choose one thing and yeah. go with it. And instead they tried to have the best of all worlds, which was like, please the fans who like this relationship and also write him as a actual bad guy. And you can't really do both here. It hasn't worked and it doesn't work. Yeah. Um, season seven, thankfully is much more straightforward. Yeah. No, I, I ex, ex tangled um, thematically and something which I take issue with and which, which I've articulated to you is how they portray the effects of his chip mm-hmm. um as necessary or as as prefer as required from episode to episode because the issue with buffy coming back and as we kind of later on tara kind of explains that it's, you know she is human but her molecules just got a bit of a dry a, um a dry cleaning or something just yeah, reshuffling yeah but just just different enough that the chip didn't register as human it implies that the chip is itself sensing something mm-hmm. um, like it's, it's projecting out a little DNA sample to be like oh I'll just grab just check if this is human or not yeah or has some capability as a, as a, as a device from the initiative has some capability to actually register human versus non-human whereas what's always been implied in the writing is that it neurologically alters Spike's behaviour so if he intends to or thinks he's attacking a human um, that he can't hurt them which makes it not only is consistent with previous writing but makes a lot more sense I think yeah, yeah. it's much more sensible um, approach so I, I definitely try not to be a stickler with this show or those kind of details, but that is, again, I think tied up with the spike stuff of like, well, we want him to be able to hit her, you know, and, mm-hmm. walk, and, and, and to imply that she's wrong. And it can't just be his opinion that she's wrong. So what do we change about that? You know, so um, it's an odd one. It also brings him into interaction with the trio as well, which has very like, I don't know how equipped they would be to actually deal with this chip, given that like everyone treats the chip as like it just cannot be removed or interacted with, you know. So. Yeah, no, it's a bizarre one. Um, the trio stuff in this episode is reasonably straightforward, though. Thankfully, it's uh, you know, they freeze them, they free, they they get a, a diamond um in a very Mission Impossible um heist from the museum. They shoot the guard with this freeze ray, and he apparently thaws out, which is good. Um, unlikely but good yeah I mean yeah yeah. you, you would you, you, you would just die um, like he how was he breathing what, what, what oxygen was he breathing anyway he thaws out and um, otherwise yeah Spike goes and threatens them to get his chip looked at and that's kind of it I think it was just more of a reminder that they're here really yeah absolutely uh, and more requisite um, neurological uh, references to limited edition Boba Fett um yeah, and more figuring. egregiously, I, I saw a lot of uh, trivia points being like, where Andrew says, I watch all of Doctor Who, and then says, but not all of um, Red Dwarf, because not all the DVDs are out yet, or it's not out in DVD, and I saw people being like, uh, you can't watch all of Doctor Who, there are like a hundred lost episodes, um, and to that I say, shut the fuck up. Yeah, or well, maybe he's watched the telesnaps as well. I think those existed at the time. Well, by ne- by necessity they did. No, but I think they were like you need uh, like like online stuff for them I don't to be think, distributed. Yeah, I don't think you could get to Doctor Who yeah. in that period. Yeah, I mean, like the thing is, like I think probably if you're talking about like Doctor Who as an American viewer, you're almost certainly talking about Tom Baker forward. Yeah, no, you're absolutely Tom right. Baker. The Tom Baker seasons of Doctor Who were um, the rights were published by PBS. Yeah, they were, and they were they. broadcast extensively, which is why whenever you see a Doctor Who reference in like Futurama and stuff, it's always, always, always Tom, Tom Baker. Baker. Yeah. yeah. And, um, yeah. Um, what do you, just to bring us to the end on, on this particular episode, because obviously this is going to be an ongoing thing with Buffy and Spike, what do you think of the sex scene? I saw it listed as like the number one sexiest scene of TV of all time. Ooh. Yeah. I, I, I don't like, I, I thought it was actually quite well done in ways. The music was quite stirring and the close, the, there was a lot of suggestive photography in a very Hitchcockian sense of like, um, the he- like the, the the walls of the house splitting apart, um, the, the metaphor itself of just like this disintegration of the self and the destruction these two are bringing onto each other with this interaction Actually, yeah. and the um, just the the inherent um aberration that it, that it exists therein, especially given that this is the Buffy's basically her first time having sex with a vampire where the repercussions aren't that that person goes on to kill a bunch of her friends yeah 
but um, I thought it was quite a, neat and quite cool in lots of ways, but not necessarily with a lot of substance. There's something like very. There's something about the Buffy Spike stuff which is so graphic, even though it's not. It feels very like okay. Previously, when people have sex, it like it has like story relevance, and it's like it's always like implied a little bit. But like here's you know it's, it's subtitle is saying unzips pants, you know, mm-hmm. inserts, etc. It's very like it's there's something willfully Explosive. physical about it. Yeah, agreed. And I don't quite know why at times, you know. But no, hey. it's a little bit inexplicable. Um, and yeah, part like yeah, there's just it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of an iconic scene. It's not one that I like, usually care about. Yeah, definitely, definitely memorable though. To the extent that we we did that thing where we watched the DVDs and the version I was on Prime for like, was this edited? Because I, I definitely my memories of it are being much more detailed. Yes, you know, than it actually really is. Yeah, in my brain, they're doing the kind of Avatar, uh, Ang, and Fire Lord. Um, same Fire Lord. Oh, was I? Oh, was I? Just like flying through the air, like <laughs> throwing each other into like through like rock pillars and stuff. And no, that's in the comics. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 And that's that's my that's my recollection of it from yeah. when I was very young. Hey, right, should we move into the Dustin Joe? Yeah, that's absolutely. Okay. Um. So some Buffy bits for you. Um. So apparently James Marsters stunt double during that um that scene the house fucking uh got knocked out by falling through the ceiling, which is not great. Um. Uh, in the magic shop at one point you can see the statue of Janus on one of the higher shelves which is the one that Ethan Rain used to um, I think it was, a, it was probably Halloween I think that he, he did all that in yeah it was like wear your other face or something yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, uh, apparently as well uh, Sarah Michelle Gellar was so loud in the sex scene that they had to um, mute her a bit and wow. to uh, add in music um, and and we're pretty sure that the moaning was removed from our DVDs, yeah. which, which is which is not fair. And yeah, the UK broadcast it was trimmed here, which is which is interesting. Do you have any um, do you have any Buffy bits first, Joe? Yeah, I enjoyed the the, the reference where um, when they were trying to do the research that Xander thought he could identify a demon in one of their ancient tombs, and it was just a and D manual. Yes, that was funny. It's like a nice reference. I enjoyed that. Um, also, learning from Angie that diamonds are excellent for, for cursing. Um, was I think kind of uh, and like a lot of references to her being like a thousand euro capitalist demon so I think the whole bit of you know with Amy of like you know Larry's gay Larry's dead high school's over here's how things have changed you know was a nice bit of contrast between th- season three essentially or you know the earlier seasons of the show with, with this period as well totally agree um, yeah great okay and some fashion notes I like at one point Buffy is wearing a purple-ish corduroy-ish jacket and it's it's only okay um, though I do generally like her 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 style in these seasons. You noted her her ponytail is is pigtails too. Pigtail, pigtails, her yeah. pigtails were, were were a little not great in this episode. I quite like when she gets her hair cut in a couple of episodes time. Um, I actually quite liked with Willow's party clothes. Mm-hmm. I thought they were like reasonably modern and like just like form fitting and and young, which is is good. And Amy is wearing quite a nice top, which is loads of rips along the arm, which is kind of cool. Um, but everyone in the in the bronze pretty much was dressed absolutely awfully. Yeah, everyone was dressed very again, kind of spring of the teenage witch, early two thousands, group seeing, big primary colours, bizarre accessories, all this kind of stuff. One hundred percent. Um, do you have a death count for us, Joel? Yeah, death count for this episode is a big old zero. Zero. No deaths in this episode. You smashed that. Death of innocence. <laughs> uh, maybe. But uh no. You know, I've never actually thought about it, it's, but like, obviously he smashed, the house is smashed down, smashed drunkenness, um, but also like smashing, or getting smashed is, is definitely something that you'd say in the UK yeah. for, for having sex. Yeah. Okay. And a rating. Do you have a rating for us, Joe? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I do. I will give this episode of Buffy 7.7 frozen rusties. Yeah, tell me about it. Um, d- enjoyable to watch i think the amy stuff is interesting i think you know it's you know between the willow stuff and the spike stuff like it's definitely not filler it's like there's some stuff happening here that has a lot of connotations to it 
um, and a lot of in- intrigue, fun scenes in the bronze, um, good acting, I think, b- between James Marsters and Sarah Michelle Gellar, whatever the, the themes of the scene. Um, but yeah, it comes down a little bit by the fact that the trio stuff all there was like really additional, you know. Um, and I see even Lamp posted or Lamp shaded by the fact that they're, the Scoobies are like, you feel like there's something happening in the town, but it's like really lame and we're not really paying attention to it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think um, there's a touch of just awkwardness to a couple of the themes they're trying to do in this season, which makes it less, it feels less assured to watch. Yeah. So I think that kind of brings it down a little bit for you, but definitely an enjoyable episode. Yeah, I was going to say 7.6. Uh, high school's kind of overs out of 10. I, um, I, yeah, very similar to what you were saying. A lot of the themes are quite strong. A lot of the portrayals are quite strong. I thought the dialogue was kind of badly written at times, to be honest, in this episode. I think the the messiness around the spike stuff takes away from it for me. I like just it felt like tonal whiplash to have last episode he's you know hoping for redemption and this episode he's like oh, I'll just I'll just kill someone to test out this this old chip um, and stuff like that. It just it just it didn't didn't fully sit right with me. Um, and I don't I don't love this section. The next episode I really don't like. <laughs> the the stuff with willow on the ceiling um drugging herself out herself out mm. um like feels kind of silly to me um so yeah just as a general as a general theme for this stretch of episodes i'm, I'm not all about it anyway um yeah cool should we move on to cordelia chase there joel yeah that's so over on the cordelia chase this week we're looking at lullaby which is the conclusion of the kind of darla's pregnant mini arc and I would say uh, pr- probably the str- but the strongest of this mini arc yes. um, comes to a culmination. We see a lot more about why Hulk's, I suppose, hates Angel so much. We see, obviously, we've seen previously like, they killed his family, but we see that um, a number of scenes with uh, Hulk's finding his young daughter, who has we realize has been turning into a vampire, as he doesn't necessarily realize it yet, and him coming to the culmination of like, having to throw her out into the sunlight and burn her, and like becoming like ironclad about this family uh, element to his vendetta um, with Angel. Um, and just a lot of, I think, great acting throughout the episode between Dave Boreanaz and Julie Benz around their, their relationship with the fact that Darla does love Connor, does love the baby, yeah. but feels that that love and that purpose is something which she you know, she hasn't felt for the entire time since, she, vampire, since, yeah. since, she's, since, since she died, struggling a lot with her own... Um, humanity when she came back and he's now feeling some purpose through connor and um, but feels that as soon as he's born um that that will go away you yeah. know um and angel feeling like he has one opportunity to be a, a real boy essentially and actually do something tangible mundane grounded you know in, in raising the child um good bit of pressure kind of in terms of the adventure side of the episode we have um Lila trying to find out kind of what's going on, trying to you know drive Wolf and Harris' interest, finding the ancient prophecies. A lot of trying to interpret the prophecies, as saying that there won't be birth, only death. Uh, it's very you know, uh, what was it? Mac- Macbeth will not be a woman born, mm-hmm. uh, or that kind of thing. Um, well, no, yeah, but yeah. Go on, go on. No, just like no matter woman born, will kill him. Go on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, no. I'm just saying, like from 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 Macbeth. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um. And a lot of that kind of interpretive stuff, which like adds a certain friction to it, um, and we have the combination of um, Hulk's actually, I think, for you know, a seventeen hundreds vampire hunter, causing a fairly threatening um, silhouette as he pursues them, and um, coming down into Caritas where they're trying to find sanctuary and try to have the birth there, meeting the group, them having no idea who he is because Angel isn't there, leaving, and then even though the place is meant to be protected by sanctuary spells, throwing a bomb in from the outside and destroying the set, essentially. So that's, that's Caritas gone now. Yeah. Um, and pursuing them until they're in the the rain, pelting down, angels trying to cradle Darla, um, all that kind of stuff, Hulk's about to kill him. And then Darla like, basically says, you know, he's, you know, Connor's the one good thing we ever did. Make sure he knows that. And staking herself. And because... And because of that allowing the baby to be rescued and saved from inside of her essentially so like intense in, in, intense in, on a lot of themes uh, and then Hulk's letting them go and it's seeming like a moment of mercy but it's really like he realises this is a vector that he can hurt Angel much more 
hurt like much more thoroughly than actually killing him is by taking his family away from him as well yeah. the um, um the, the the concluding scene is actually quite like it's quite stirring it's visually very strong it's out in the back alley where a lot of the kind of important angel moments take place like um faith and angel fighting that time and her saying that like i'm worthless etc i'm not even mm. sure what her phrase actually was at the time but oh, and also it's where the season fina- series finale will take place where they kind of take run into the charge with kind of no interest in surviving mm. etc so um this yeah i found the scene quite visually strong and quite emotionally strong um it's quite a good send off to darla as a character because she has been an emotionally conflicted character in some ways and other ways kind of not and this giving giving her a way out in a, in a moment of um genuine complexity and uh like emotional high point on her uh, own terms on her own yeah. terms etc i think it's, it's it's very strong um the whole stuff is actually i don't remember it being quite as like well thematically tied up as it is actually in this episode like mm-hmm. it's, it's just very well connected to the to the the pl- like that subplot of holtz's background is very well connected to the um the angel plot at the same time yeah um so daryl dusting like angel holding her hand as she turns to dust is like one of the better inclusions of that mechanic i think in in the buffy verse you know of kind of like actually using it to like visual effects yeah mm-hmm, mm-hmm. absolutely um so joe what would you give this episode yeah, probably eight fail feminist gestures. Same, yeah. It's a very solid episode. Um, I thought that I thought the the Lila stuff was sometimes a bit plotty, like the 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 translation stuff. I thought some of the um, some of the what's the what, what's Angel's gang called? Angel, Angel the, investigations, like Angel the yeah, investigations. Yeah, the, some fa- investi- the fan gang sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> some of their uh, interactions were a little off, but the the good drama was quite good. And um, oh yeah, and I really didn't like when when uh the suggestion that darla at one point she's getting annoyed at um cordelia fred uh wesley and gun and in, when she's just lying in the car pregnant and she's like get away from me and just kicks and p- throws her arms out in all directions to throw them all away equally almost like a shock blast yeah, yeah, yeah. i was like what the fuck is that going yeah, on she did use her special yeah <laughs> it was just bizarre that took me out of it um but no i thought it was very good yeah absolutely enjoyable okay great um, so that's us for this week on buffy boys thanks as always for joining us we hope you're well and safe and happy and wholesome um if you enjoyed this episode please let us know tell your f- friends tell your frozen security guards and we will see you next time right here on buffy boys buffy boys see you see you